Welcome back to the Biohacks podcast. Today we are joined by head cycling coach and endurance trainer Robert Foster from uh, the gym Inner Fight based in Dubai. Uh, Robert, we're going to be talking all things periodization. So uh, thanks for coming on, mate. No worries, man. Nice to be here. We'll give Robert up. as well. Robert, we're going full Robert. <laughs> full Robert. Rob Foster. <laughs> Um, do you want to give the guys a bit of a rundown, how you, a bit of your background, how you got into endurance training and then endurance coaching? Yeah, sure. So um, from a kid, I was a runner. My, my, my uncle's Brendan Foster, so I was sort of forced into it. Uh, the whole family was bang into running. Hey? Eh? never knew that. You didn't. Ah, interesting. You must have known that. Yeah. That's the, her- that's, the, that's the heritage of running, mate. <laughs> yeah, so um, as, as a kid, like growing up, running was a big, big part of my life and I did pretty well with it. And then I pursued that into universities in terms of applied sports science at Edinburgh. Got into love, just love endurance and that always was the side that tickled me. And then after uni, got into cycling. Um, really enjoyed that, got better at it did some competitions, did the oat route was probably the highlight. So it came sixth in that, which is quite a big achievement for me personally. And then we took a huge, huge crew. How did you switch into the, onto cycling? Just as a... A caveat. Yeah, I don't really know to be honest. I just tried it and really got on with it. It's a, uh, it's, I always like to be challenged and I'm quite skinny. So getting strong on a bike is, is probably a little bit of problematic, especially in the flat. So getting and achieving that was a massive part. And I just, I like the intricacies of, of cycling and the, the little nuances when you're in a peloton or racing and it's, it's not necessarily the, the super strong person who wins unless they just like wipe the field. It's, it's the smaller little micro races within a race that actually decide it and the little the feints or whatever. So it's race craft. Is there much crossover between uh, cy- uh, running and cycling? Like- I mean, it's the same energy system, but it's a completely different mode. So that you, you can cross over and there is like triathlon, look at those guys. They can ride like beasts and they can run like animals and they train basically the same physiology. Um, but it, if, you, if you're looking at triathlon, it's steady state, right? If you're looking at 800 meters, it's just full, full gas, like lactate threshold way over. If you look at an actual cycling race, like a 150K hilly race, it's short periods of five minutes to three minutes that usually decide the race. Most of the time you can sit in and cruise. So there's, compared, if you took a marathon to a, to a 100, 150k bike race, I would say they're totally different. Require, in paper, like the same things, but in actual reality, they're like five minute power is huge compared and you don't get that in a marathon. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually, uh, it's going to help just clarify it all for, for me. So, um, that's, uh, what, so, then, so after you kind of got into cycling and what was the kind of transition into coaching? Yeah, so I, I started in, in, in Bonnie, Newcastle, where I, where I applied my trade to start with. I was uh, at a gym, uh, as assistant manager at a gym, and also worked in endurance at a CrossFit place, and then started coaching off the back of that and set up my own little business, um, just coaching individuals who wanted to either run or ride a bike. And then I got really angry at the job in Newcastle one day, and I, I applied for Athlete Lab in London, which is where we met which is a cycling performance lab in the center of London, which is works on power and it trains people who are novices to like people who want to get age group categories or triathlon age group categories. So, and then I started coaching off the back of that. So cycle training then became and coaching became a massive part of my life. Really, really happy with it. And it's, I think it's a really working with power and working with heart rate and having actual metrics for a sports scientist gives you a totally different dimension to psych, uh, to actual coaching. And from there, went well, quit that job, went for a bit of a wander around the world, saw some, some Kenyans. They were pretty, pretty quick on their feet. Saw some uh, South African cyclists as well and worked with some like, uh, charities out there, which is awesome fun. And then went to New Zealand, did a bit of coaching there. Uh, again, a bit of a jolly, but managed a cycling gym there as well. And then I ended up in Dubai somehow working for this company, Enterprise Endurance, with a guy I used to work with in London. Um, doing in general endurance training and um, focusing more on cycling, running, because obviously those two areas are my specialty and a lot of triathlon as well, because that's an area where I've always, I've always been interested because it's joining three 
like knitting three disciplines up together and nailing that is is a real fun game like it's a puzzle and you've got to fix it nice that's a, a very succinct rundown really um really insightful just you mentioned about heart rate you mentioned about power um obviously as, you, as a coach i guess you get customers come to you and they want to or athletes come to you and they want to improve um what's like the you talk about the metrics like what's the difference between using heart rate and what's the difference between using like power outload do they kind of go synergistically together or how does that work can you explain that a bit more there are two little reference points so power never lies end of um it's a metric that doesn't change depending on heart like depending on wind depending on atmosphere depending on how much caffeine you've had so it's a more stable metric so i like to think of to think of power is how fit you are and then heart rate to say how fresh or red you are for exercise. So if you have about a ton or a jug of coffee before you go out for a run, your heart rate's going to be jacked. So your heart rate zones might not, might not necessarily comprehend like, or, or sink in with actually what you're doing on the run. Um, if you do that on the bike as well, so you might be in zone two on the bike, but if you've had too much caffeine or lack of sleep, your heart rate's jacked anyway because you're fatigued because you're tired before you get on the bike. So using the two together, I think is a really good idea. And it's something I love, I love to do because it gives you an idea of how the freshness and the form is of the athlete. But power is the more stable thing. It's just how fit you are, how much power you can generate. And with that, you can get pretty rival zones to train to. It's not the be all and end all. There's a lot more to it than a simple number and riding to it. Cause like anything, we're human beings, right? So we do, vary from day to day and it's appreciating a metric that is stable but also you've got to take into life which is really interesting and heart rate is your day to day how much you recover what sort of training zones you hit like they've just brought out running power which is a really interesting concept like stride foot pods mm -hmm. um running power has been around for years but the reliability of it day to day are you economy? sorry are you economy or is that yeah yeah it's big it really measures running economy it's huge it's if if the, the stuff that's coming out at the minute yeah so it used to be rubbish like it's it's fine being consistently inconsistent within this like within the same person so if i've got if i know my power is xyz on a on a like a the gold standard which is running on a force platform plate force reaction, ground force reaction plate, and you just, you can get a steady power. And then your, your power pod is a little bit off, but it's consistently off. Mm. means you can still train to it pretty accurately. But what happened with the old stuff is that the, the, the tech just wasn't like high enough. So what mm. you found then was that people were, were running and it just, yeah, you never knew where you were running. Is it zone two? Is it zone four? How much power, how many watts am I actually creating on this run? Um, but now they've developed the technology a lot more reliable or to become a lot more reliable. And what you find now is that it's becoming a more steady metric. So this could literally change running for everybody. It's mental. And then that becomes the same as it on a bike. So you can use the power to figure out how fit you are. And then you can use your heart rate to see how fresh you are. Interesting. I guess this is a whole thing, isn't it? With fit tech now, it's like the whole landscape has been changed by technology. And as, as the technology improves, allowing us to basically map what would be chaotic systems which we just have to use like a stopwatch before yeah make assumptions about <laughs> make assumptions about where um, it's time it's time is going up so we think he's getting better but it was a lot colder on that day so we don't really know but we think he's getting a lot better let's say, let's see how he races and like now it's you race at that level and you race at that power zone you can maintain it for two hours look at kip Chogi when he when he did the sub two, he was running pretty much at his critical power. And anything above that, he would have blown. Anything below it, he would have been too cozy and he would not have broken two. So if you could get, if you had a foot pot on, it'd be pretty interesting to see it. And then you can see your economy. So you can see if you run at the same speed at the same day in the same environment and you put out less power, but you maintain the same speed, it means that you're more economical. It's so simple and it's a real, it's a real statement of this training is working. So in terms of coach for me and for you, like it's, it's a metric that you can track and measure. Perfect. That's, I'm sorry, I just I wanted to just go in on that and clarify. Um, so that's help. I think some people will find that really helpful. So any novice athletes out there, anybody listening to this, I guess, um, obviously we'll give you some more details so you can 
get some more information from Rob at the end, but definitely looking at those two metrics, would that be, would you say that's a good place to start for people? Um, yeah, get, get used to, get used to metrics, um, get used to effort level and then do a couple of tests and then base your training off those tests mm. and always retest. So there's no point in doing one test and leaving it for six months because you will get better. So constant retesting, especially for a novice, because your, your rate of improvements can be so exponential compared to somebody who's quite well-trained. So you don't have to test as regularly with a well-trained person because they don't improve as much because they're, they're flattened out a little bit. What are your favorite, what are your favorite tests? What do you like to use? It depends on the person. For, yeah, for the, for the run, I lactate heart rate test is a classic, like 30 minutes in the treadmill, just beast yourself. Um, I like steady state stuff and I think it gives a good reflection of the person as well. See how their form dips so you can really like monitor how they move through the test and how much they can push themselves. And then on the bike, it's got a, like we did a ramp test of the day on the bike for the power, which just incrementally just adds and adds wattage until you crack. Um, and then you've got the 20 minute test as well, the FTP. So I think the 20 minutes, my favorite There's the hour, but that's just sacrilegious. Why, why would you do that? What's that? It's a good train session, but you're never going to push an hour hard unless you're in a race, like max out hard. It's, it's not fair, and it's a complete waste. Yeah, so uh, uh, that would be my favourites. 20-minute uh, FTP, ramp, and lactate heart rate. Interesting. Uh, and obviously, we can leave, so we must be able to leave some links below if people want to check out um, any, any, any of those kind of topics we're going to go through today. Um, we'll leave some links in the description below. So we said we're going to talk about a little bit about periodization. So do you want to give like anybody who doesn't understand what periodization is? I'm sure people have a bit of an idea, but do you want to go give the guys a bit of a rundown? Um, yeah. So basically, if you look, periodization is a way to to manage and create a plan for your year, really, and it's it's a a legit like a logical way to plan in your route to an event. So periodization really works best if you've got an event in mind. Usually like, so an Olympic year is four years, so your macro cycle is four years. Um, and then, but if you're looking, say I'm targeting Nice next year, which is about, it's in July, it's an Ironman. This is theoretical, I'm not actually targeting Nice. Um, <laughs> it's x amount of months away and then you can break your training blocks down to hit different parameters of fitness to make sure that when you get to your event you've ticked off every single box and it's just you basically have macro cycle which is the whole thing you have meso cycle which breaks it down in chunks usually like in traditional block periodization it's like four weeks or five weeks depending on the person and then you have little micro which is Tinky ones, which can be five to seven days, whatever you really fancy. Um, depends on the individual, 100%. But it's just you get your year plan, you break it down a bit more, and you say what you want to achieve in each block, and you do it again. So even smaller, so each week has a target. It means that everything's target driven. It means that everything is planned, so you know the ramp rate. So if you start, if you're a couch to 5K or a couch to half marathon, you can plan pretty accurately how you want to get and where you should be at certain points along that journey. So you can say, yes, I'm achieving or I need to modify something. It also like prevents injury, overtraining, overreaching, et cetera. And the whole, the whole idea is that, is that you take your macro, then you go into your, uh, your, like your four-week block and it's overload. So every four or five weeks, you overload the body consistently and then you allow it to recover so you can adapt to the changes. Without ad like that recovery week or recovery three days, depends on the person, you don't give yourself any time to fully adapt to the changes and stress that you've been placing on the body in the last three weeks. I've got like, if you, if you punch a peach, you bruise it, right? So that's what we're doing. We're just constantly bruising the body and asking more and more of it. And the, like the physiology. So you go in your, your base block, you're asking your cardiovascular system and your, like your aerobic um, metabolism to improve. You're asking more of it, and it's a constant stress and then recovery. That's the, I think that's the idea. <laughs> no, I don't think, but I think I've given a half decent answer there. It's an adaption, right? That's what it kind of boils down to this idea. That, and there's a big reminder for anybody listening that you don't get better during the training session. Like the training session is like exactly like Rob says. It's obviously the the, the period where you damage your body, you damage the energy system, you damage the 
metabolic system that you're working on and then it's in the recovery period where you actually get better and this is actually like Rob said I guess it's this idea of stress and pushing yourself slightly outside of your comfort zone but like exactly like the best thing I think kind of you alluded to there is this idea that it's about trying to find that balance between pushing on and then not doing too much so that then you don't break I guess as well I think you obviously mentioned yeah you stop overreaching or overtraining which is like the classic pitfall of any person starting a training program is I'm going to do 15 hours a week of just balls out training. <laughs> and within three weeks, they're on the floor and they're still trying to train. It's like, what are you doing? Just relax. Like, if you've got a plan, then you can actually stick to it. I think that's a really good point, actually. So, like, you get somebody who comes in a complete novice, like, is that the first thing you do with them? You kind of set their expectation and help them kind of map out the journey a little bit. So, yeah, 100%. So, if I get somebody who's coming in to ride, so we've got well, we, we've got the coast to coast here in, in Dubai and it's a hilly race and I've had a bloke come on six months to train for it and it's okay. Within the six months, this is how it's going to look and this is the areas we're going to be hitting and this is how we're going to increase your load to maximize the adaptation and also minimize your risk of injury to basically get you, you look at the demands of the race and you say, I need to be good at that, that, that. And you say, okay, how am I going to do that? And what's the logical steps to make that better? And then you, you can tell them, you can quite easily communicate that with them. So they have realistic, yeah, realistic expectations about how the training process works. They also understand and develop a great appreciation of rest, which is the hardest thing to convey to a client. Like a, an athlete is rest. No, nope, won't do it. <laughs> so yeah, it's, a, it's, it's really interesting. And I think there's obviously different ways. There's like, classic block training and then there's a uh, linear and then there's like just non-linear where you just you just dot and weave um but yeah i i always like to go block for a new client or just most clients to be honest because that really works with life because people people have jobs people have everything right so they've got a balance the clients i'm working with usually have high stress jobs families and so block training works a lot better in terms of mapping out everything do you do, do you do something different for yourself? Do you, do you, block, do you block? How do you prioritize your training? Block block works for me really well. I get an idea of where I'm going, and it means that I can because obviously I'm I'm busy going around training with clients, like running with them or running as a group. Um, and it's it's pretty busy at work because I I handle the the social media and the community side of it as well. So it's very very sporadic. So having block means I can. I can sort of nail down what I'm trying to achieve and make it achievable for me. If you're running with clients, like does that just like that impact your own type of training? Or do you kind of make it all fit in, or how does that? How do you manage that? Make, make it fit in, yeah. It's it's usually a Rico run for me. <laughs> Not to sound too cocky, <laughs> but, but uh, like a, a five to six minute K run for somebody who's training who's never done a marathon before, it's hard work from this threshold session or it's a tempo session. For me, that's, that's down in recovery. Nice. Um, bike rides I use as training for myself. So if, if they're, they're a little bit weaker or they're just starting out, I'll just sit in the front and tow. If they're stronger than me, which happens on the flats around here, I sit and I, I, <laughs> I critique. <laughs> Yell orders. <laughs> yeah. Go faster. No, it's... Um, you have to you have to be smart with that because there are, I had to have a week off recently, um, which wasn't planned because I did the fifty 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 and then I went straight into the normal week, which was sort of recovery but not enough. Um, so we all we're all we're all <laughs> we're all victims of it, and then I went straight into a training camp that we had planned, and so I was just cooked. My body, my CNS was absolutely cooked. I was just just week off in bed. I think I saw some pictures on Instagram. I think of you just like asleep. Yeah, uh, it was a lot of sleep that week. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you've got a plan and a program set out. But obviously, within that, do you have like do you allow yourself the flexibility? So if it's not quite the numbers aren't ticking the right direction, like what's what's like your um, guiding principle with listening to the body? Okay, so that's a really good question, actually. Um, you start with that plan and that gives you structure and that gives you an idea of where you want to be. And then comes the fun part for a coach. Cause any coach, anybody can really set out a plan. 
and lay it down and have a good basic understanding of what needs to be done and how they're going to do it. It's, it's the juggling and the weaving week to week, day to day. That is, I think, the most interesting thing as a coach to try and maintain the stress, but also allow for irregularity. So over like fatigue, when fatigue really builds up. So if they don't, that first month for me is a really important time to figure out how they can work and how much they respect the process as athletes and how much they take the other stuff. So the sleep, I mean, however, it's, it was, it was a, a medical study or like a sports science study put out recently and the, the YLM sports science like put a little infographic about sleep is the most effective form of recovery period. Uh, like with it's, <laughs> and we all know it, don't we? We all, we all know what good sleep does to us, but we constantly neglect that side of it. So knowing how they respect the process and knowing how they adapt to load gives you a big insight into how the athlete is going to respond to more load. And then you just juggle it accordingly to make sure that they don't overreach and they still achieve. I really like that terminology. It's a nice terminology, respect the process. It's a good one. I'm going to steal that. That's, um... <laughs> I think I stole that one as well. So <laughs> it's respect and trust the process. It's a good, um, it's a good analogy. Um, so I guess so you have your structure and then within that then you allow for flexibility depending on how they how they respond um and exactly and you and you monitor that by heart rate by general feeling so like rp during a run or how they wake up or heart rate variability so that's a big thing we use here in fight endurance we pretty much insist that every single athlete has heart rate variability which is basically measures the difference between the parasympathetic and sympathetic um, heartbeat like to boom, boom 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 and if it gets longer then they're getting more tired if it gets shorter they're getting less tired so it gives you a better idea of recovery you measure that i've seen like these fingerprint things or do they do a heart rate monitor or heart rate monitor because fingerprint things are highly inaccurate so we we basically get or uh recommend that you wake up stick your heart rate strap on lie there for two minutes call it a two minute extended lie-in and just stick the app on and it records and then it, it syncs up with training peaks and then we can track it. Obviously the first two, three weeks is the data is all over the place because we haven't got a base of data to base it off. Um, but as you get into like third, four months, then it really, it really rings true and you can say quite accurately, yeah, you're knackered, take a day off. Interesting. Interesting. That's actually- cool. Or you can get those whoop bands. You've seen those. And they're the, there's also the rings now that also recover. Um, monitor the uh, yeah the heart rate variability which is that's super cool because that means you don't have to think about it it's just there which is probably more accurate because you think about it more you're gonna your heart rate's gonna rise because of apprehension about it definitely yeah so obviously you've got your, your structure and within that then so we have your flexibility and obviously then you try and now we're even adding metrics not only to the loading side but we're also adding a metric to the kind of recovery side and i guess um I think, yeah, obviously more data, I guess, allows you to kind of plan and kind of be more, make more informed decisions about kind of which direction you're going to push, push the athlete in, I guess, doesn't it? So, um, 100%. Um, what, what's like kind of like the shortest, more, most intense type of training? I'm just thinking about maybe if we kind of go from short to long, like what's, what's the kind of periodization? Like what's the shortest uh, competitions and events that people um, do with you? And what's the periodization look for that? What are the kind of key things you're looking for? And then maybe if you go through to all the way through to like, what's the longest um, type of events, like ultras? Type of- ultras, God, I love the ultra. So the, the shortest competition I'm training somebody for at the minute, we all, we all tend to go long here in Dubai. <laughs> um, Let's do a theoretical, somebody was doing a John Smith. All right, the- Oh, John. <laughs> John Smith. All right. Uh, okay, so John Smith's training for a 10K. Okay. Um, so Mr. John Smith or is a time, 10 mile time trial. Similar, similar sort of effort. So pretty much at threshold. You're looking firstly to, it's, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty similar when you look at it on a bit of paper. You always want to start with the fundamentals, which is the capacity to produce energy aerobically. So that's your, your base block. 
and then you build it up. So you, you've got these phases, right? So you've got base phase, or actually before all of that starts, you've got preparation phase. So that's the same with anybody. Um, if it's a power athlete going short, you want to develop power. So it's usually involves a little bit more like power lifting and strength and conditioning on the back of that as they prepare to train. It's, it's the keys in the world, really. Um, and you look at any sort of irregularities in their, their biomechanics and their gait in things that you automatically see need to be fixed. So to prepare them to take on the load, that's going to be here. In the case of a, a threshold athlete, so 10, 10K, 5K or 10 mile time trial, you're looking at their ability to cope with intensity because the, the efforts which come later on near race competition are going to be a lot more intense than say somebody in a 70.3 or full Ironman, like period. And the rest recovery is going to be a lot higher. So you've got to prepare them aerobically first after the preparation phase, and then you're going to move them through pretty sharply like strength endurance. So they're, they're resilient to intensity. And then you look at further on, you, you go basically start to build up their threshold and work a lot more threshold. And you probably include about four sessions a week of real, real high intensity efforts, sometimes above, like consistently above for three minutes, eight minutes, and then a long period of recovery. Because when you look at the short efforts, it's not just physiologically you're getting cooked. It's your nervous system and your recruitment that will also suffer massively. The higher intensity of the session, the more time off you've got to give to recover fully not just physiologically, for the actual recruitment of your muscles and the ability to stimulate enough to, to reproduce those efforts. So that's, I think, the biggest thing and difference as you look as you build up towards a competition, if it's shorter, is more time off. <laughs> you have a huge base block, you have a big strength block, which looks very similar to a triathlon or a long, like an ultra event. But as you get further and further in, the time becomes less because the intensity is so, so high. And that's, that's heart rate zones, power zones. It's whatever you want to use as your metric. If you're looking at your 70.3 or your full Ironman track, like athlete or your ultra, you actually could do a bit of reverse periodization, which has got a lot of, a lot of people loving that recently. Um, actually, in the last year, since Team Sky started doing it. So they start with super high intensity to try and get those benefits, so top-end power. And then as they get closer to the competition, they fall more towards their aerobic or tempo work, which is pretty much like for like what they're actually going to be competing at. So if you're doing a, a full distance Ironman or just Ironman, or you're doing an ultra, you're going to be pretty much at or just below like zone three, zone four, like threshold or sweet spot. And if you're well-trained, you're going to be there. So as you get close towards the competition, you want to start mimicking the efforts required in the actual competition. So that's, I think that if you look on a bit of paper, the first two, three months is looking very similar as you prepare the body to train, then you look at aerobic base and you look at the strength. After that, it becomes completely different um, because you start to specify your training towards the actual event you're doing. So more race efforts, more things that hit the physiology of the, what you're trying to do. You want to be as close, I guess what you're saying is you want to be as close to kind of race situation as possible the closer towards the event that you get so, so. exactly yeah you want to you want to be pretty much at race pace training at race pace about four weeks out like race practice yeah. so if no you were to look at like a, if you look at like an ultra that means going for bloody long runs <laughs> at, a, at a at a math heart rate or a really steady pace like if you do 50k in the trails your heart rate is still going to be in like zone three zone four if you can maintain it, like five hours we can all do that it's just brutal um but if you're <laughs> but if you're if you're training for 800 meters or 5k you're going to be doing so many efforts just below and repeat with a lot of rest so less continuous more more interval based training that is to recreate the, the efforts that you're doing so massive massive lactate threshold and build up and feral feral training <laughs> Yeah, I guess um, yeah, huge respect for you guys. It's how you do it, actually. So, uh, it's a uh, it's a real mental. I guess. I mean, what, I mean, how much does mindset come into this into this kind of equation? Huge, especially ultras. I, I, I found so I did my my first like Dubai ultra, 
like a couple of weeks ago that that 50 50 so it was a 50k bike 50k run and a 50k bike the only little that sounds like ah you yeah, get give it, give that a nudge but we did it into the light so it's the summer here in dubai it hits like 50 55 degrees most days at the minute uh we started just before sunrise so we did we polished the 50 first 50k bike in about an hour and quarter and it was absolutely disgracefully fast which is great because i just sat at the back <laughs> uh, and then we went into the run and the sun came up and it was just got hotter and it just got slower but i think mindset and being prepared for this sort of stuff is so important having a positive outlook having a realistic outlook as well so having a planning executing and that goes not just the event itself but it's training right so having a positive mindset and ha uh, having realistic expectations and being able to maturely deal with things that don't necessarily go right is, is so important. Petulant, throwing your prams out the, 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 the toys out the pram just doesn't work. It leaves in, in like inaccurate, inconsistent and rubbish training and racing. Cause you've always got an excuse. 100%. And I guess that's the thing. I guess the higher closer towards the elite level you get, obviously the more you're having to manage chaos. Um, I guess not even in elite level, I guess it just happens all the way through the training cycle, doesn't it? But I guess it's like being able to manage when things don't go right, can you still perform? Can you still, um, do you have the, do you have the uh, agile, agileness of mind to be able to all have the planning, I guess, maybe is actually how that can plan what happens if, what happens if or when. Um, yeah, yeah, oh, it's huge, right? Um, a really interesting thing that's happening here because of the fact that it's moving in September. Are we in September? I don't know. Uh, apparently it happens here. This is my first summer in Dubai. It gets super humid. So at the minute it is ridiculously humid. And pace, like heart rate, <laughs> heart rate is out the window. Power is down. People are struggling to exercise to, to these normal metrics that day in, day out they train to. So then you go RPE and then you go mindset. So are you mature enough to handle the fact that your 1K pace at the minute is just not there? Because you can't. The ceiling doesn't allow you to. But are you, are you agile enough to, to react to that? Because I guess because of the environment, it's interesting. It's like, yeah, I guess what you're doing is you're aligning what's going on around you, something which is out of your control, um, and your ability to be able to react and be able to be kind of see the long... It's like long game, isn't it? Like being able to see the bigger picture. Exactly, yeah. So... It's a huge ego check for a lot of people, and it's uh, it's interesting trying to communicate that over to them, saying just just leave it, leave your paces at the door if it's super humid, but you're still doing good training if your RP is accurate. So if you're honest with yourself, and you say, "Oh, this feels really easy," but you're actually going like like eyeballs out, that's not honesty. That's not relating an actual number, like a feeling, a sensation to your heart rates that you previously trained against. So it's it's super interesting. And that in itself is why periodization is good. I think it, it brings it back into there because if you've got a plan of where you want to be and how hard you want to train and what's coming up the next day, then say humidity is rubbish outside. You still know that you're training aerobic, you're training strength. Mm. So you can adjust a lot quicker, I think, if you know why you're doing it. You can measure, you can manage, isn't it? That's what they say, the old adage. So um, like that <laughs> I did, yeah, it's decent. Um, right, we're going to look to look to wrap up in a minute. So don't take too much of your time to maybe uh, recover. Um, just one, one final question. So we talked a little bit about novice periodization. What about for guys who are trying to push on and they want they're more at the top of the spectrum, like they're kind of more uh, getting towards the elite level? Um, what kind of differences do you see? Like, what's the difference between somebody at novice? Like, what? Just any insights for anybody who's a bit further down the line? Um, a, a bit further down the line, right? So in terms of your periodization, you know, and you've got a lot more data to back up what you've previously done. So you're not shooting in the dark. You know, you're, you're a known quantity. So training can be a lot more specific to weaknesses that you, you know. And then results in terms of monitoring, tracking progress can also be a lot more accurate. And you know where you are because you've got two, three, four years worth of data to back that up and use as comparisons. I think that's a, a really big thing. So also non-linear non uh, periodization, 
uh, you train until you get better. And for a, an elite athlete, that's sometimes what they take on. Mm. So they just push, 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 and they do it on a weekly basis to see how the body's adapting. And then using the old metrics, they can move on to the next box once they're done. done. If that makes sense. Yeah, instead of like saying it's going to take four weeks and then we'll move on, they say, okay, we'll monitor it and we'll see if so. We'll see, we'll, we'll repeat the session we did three weeks ago. And if your efficiency factor is less than like 5% or if your power to heart rate or like, yeah, power to heart rate ratio is less than 3%, which means you're working aerobically, which means you've adapted properly, we can move on to the next block. Mm. So a, more, a person who's a bit further down the line can, doesn't have to be so rigid to move on to the next block before they've uh, made the adaptations that are necessary to improve. I was going to say, so if they pick the, and if they pick the correct tests or the correct parameters, they know that getting X in a particular test or in a particular parameter will then knock on to allow them to get Y, which then knocks on to their race, but making them, allowing them to kind of beat their PB type of thing. So that- Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they know, they know uh, like stimulus and consequence. So or adaptation and consequence. So they know that that's going to make that better. And last year they were doing that. And they're this way, this year they weigh this much and they're putting out that much power. So it just means it's a little more streamlined and also you get a lot better feedback. Well, if, um, if guys want to find any more information out about you or what you do, is there a place that can contact you? We can leave a particular link in the description box below. Yeah, sure. So you can go on my Instagram and drop me a message there. So that's just re underscore foster. Or you can drop me an email, which is rf at innerfight.com. Um, or you can go through our main innerfight page. Brilliant. Now, it's been super helpful, mate. We'll know, get you back on again at some point and we'll um, delve into some more scientific principles. It's been um, super helpful. It would be really appreciated for you. Running economy. I, I should have thought of that. That's sick. We'll, we'll get onto that. Um, guys, if you like the video, hit like as it obviously helps us uh, with the YouTube algorithm. Also hit subscribe and the notification bell. Uh, so when we get Rob back on, we produce more cool content like this. You'll uh, be the first to get it. Rob, appreciate you. Thanks for coming on, buddy. No worries. Thank you very much. Good to see you.